Namaste. We continue with the synthesis of yoga. And uh, we are on this part one, the yoga of divine works. A natural question is, how is it different from the yoga of the Gita? Or is it the same? Quite naturally, if it is the same, then Shubhinda has already elaborated a lot in essays on the Gita. Essays on the Gita and the Synthesis of Yoga were running as parallel series in the Arya. <clears throat> the purpose of Synthesis of Yoga was different. The Yoga of the Gita was born due to a crisis in the consciousness of Arjuna, who wanted to know the right principle of action and what he should do and not do. So while Shubhindu touches upon it, and yet he takes us both in terms of quantitative elaboration on certain aspects, which Sri Krishna mentions passingly, because uh, uh, naturally there is a shortage of time, the Gita is in a context of war. I seriously believe it, Shubhindu has also spoken about it, but the whole style of the Gita is such that it is actually very clearly written in an, in face to face in an actual war. I agree that Vyas has written it down and it goes to him, but the whole context is never missed out. And <clears throat> on the other hand, the yoga of divine works is how works can become a preparation for ultimately in the divine manifestation, the divine victory, the fulfillment of the divine will upon earth. That will we have been told is uh, in the Gita is hinted, Lok Sangraharth. So, march of humanity forward. So, <laughs> but what does this mean? Where is this march going? Where is this karma of humanity being led? All this is there in uh, the synthesis of yoga. And the yoga of divine works is, as I said, most powerful entry point. We read about the four eights and then we touched upon self-consecration self-surrender and sacrifice. So these are three key words. So what really is consecration? Consecration is when we begin to um, orient ourselves away from the ego self and toward the divine self. Take for example, the motive of human life ordinarily is to satisfy the ego. This is the ordinary motive. Consecration means I have turned this motive towards the divine. And there Shubhinda reveals to us that how, first of all, it takes a long time before human consciousness is prepared for this turning. Because every strand in <coughs> us is shot through and through with the fiber of the ego. Every fiber in us, including spiritual pursuit. We may apparently undertake sadhana and yoga, but even that may be done for personal egoistic purposes. And the subtlest form of egoism is mukti, moksha, freedom, liberation, as if others were nobody, we had nothing to do with anyone uh, upon earth, we had nothing to do with all that is happening upon earth, I am just seeking my own liberation. So it itself is a, ultimately if we look at it, a very sublimated, refined form of egoism. So um, all that aspect is there, which is uh, in consecration, we turn everything to the divine, including if we are seeking liberation from the earth nature, from the ignorance of earth nature, it's not just for personal moksha. Moksha will come, inevitably. It's a first step needed. But this moksha has to be turned into making us a channel for a divine center, divine work in humanity and upon earth. It's not to escape from the cycle of birth and death and rebirth and karma and all that. So, consecration is orienting our life to the divine. That means everything. And Shubhinda explains from the morning till night and night till morning, every activity has to be consecrated, given. Consecration literally makes it sanctified. And the typical example is, when we are coming from, typical example of consecration, when we are going to a temple, so we pick up some uh, nariyal, we pick up some other things, and we are <laughs> carrying it to the deity. So when we enter the temple, we give it to the priest. So what does the priest do? He takes it inside. So there is a sanctimonious ritual. After that ritual, he brings it back. He gives it back to us. Now what is the difference? Nothing has changed. The same thing. The deity has not uh, eaten anything. But it is a sanctification. 
now it is prasad before taking it to the deity it is food so when we are eating it now we are eating it with the spirit that it is a prasad so consecration is literally all our <laughs> activities various activities every day our life aims everything should be oriented to the divine to serve the divine to fulfill the divine will this is consecration next step is surrender so consecration is orienting ourselves to the divine Con surrender is giving ourselves to the divine so that takes us to one step further so when arjuna says tell me keshav i want to live for you it's it doesn't use that very word but he says you tell me what should i do in consecration i do what i want to do but i give it to the divine but here i give myself to the divine so self surrender that's why there is a beautiful term and when i give <laughs> myself to the divine when i live not just for the divine but give myself to the divine then comes self surrender this self surrender creates a as shubindo reveals to us and as everybody knows with this practice that slowly uh, if we do it persistently we uh, enter into a not division but we begin to see that there is this movement of nature which is like waves and there is this self which is surrendered to the divine that's where the gita ultimately ends through all the processes that the soul or the self is given to the divine completely sarva dharman parityajya but nature continues by its own momentum so that's where the gita takes us it's a very high peak it says liberation through works jivan mukta because inwardly one remains untouched even though all the activities of nature continue as per the past momentum as per the habits the mechanisms of nature sometimes the word used is to exhaust the karma sometimes it's people don't even care about the nature whatever happens pishach vat unmat vat jad vat bal vat but here the aim of yoga is not that because even the outer nature every activity of nature has to be transformed so now comes the chapter 4 about the sacrifice so how are we going to change nature itself so that's where sacrifice comes in <clears throat> and shubindo starts this there are three chapters first chapter which is chapter 4 the sacrifice the triune path and the lord of the sacrifice triune path is here where he summarizes the entire gita so what really sacrifice sacrifice is the law of creation and we look at its description is in the rig veda where the one purusha becomes all this that we experience so how it happens the gods come into existence before that no one knows that's why the rig veda 10th mandala says that even the gods know him not because that is a state when gods have not come into existence but then the gods come into existence and they do a sacrifice the gods and the sages and the purusha is sacrificed of course shubindo says it's not just the purusha but much more the divine mother's holocaust so the purusha sacrifices himself and out of his body all this vast wonderful universe is born so what does it mean it means because this is the original law by sacrifice the prajapati has established this world nobody can ever live continue to live for himself and himself alone as if he were separate and isolated in this world it is just not allowed it cannot be why because it's like if i keep on you know exercising only one part and not others it will be to the detrimental of the rest of the being which is feeding and this law applies everywhere even in economics if one group develops becomes very very uh, you know rich but all around is slums then what will happen is who will be there to pay him so so everything must progress to an ex to a certain extent uh, economy should be all inclusive life should be all inclusive so the law of sacrifice is there as a natural corrective to our egoism so when people live only for themselves or their so called family there is a corrective in built they will sooner or later face that i did a foolish thing if they are intelligent enough to understand they are doing a foolish thing but if they are foolish enough not yet to understand they will only curse and complain and eventually pass away so there is this law of sacrifice the other aspect of law of sacrifice is what should be my way of life so shubindo brings out that story of yagyavalk where when he is asked why does one love the wife why does one love the child 
Why does one love the country? And Yagnavalk says that one does not love the wife for the sake of the wife, but for the sake of the self, and so on and so forth. Meaning thereby that it does not mean we have to leave outwardly people. That's what sannyas talks about. But the Gita talks about tyaga, renunciation. I leave my egoistic attachment and preferential interest that my desire self takes in them. That I have to leave. Because if one has to be a true doer of divine work, it has to be kept aside. So, several examples we know in, in uh, our spiritual history. Uh, for instance, Raja Harishchandra. He takes a vow of truth. So, he goes to what extent, what extreme? Raja Shivi. He takes the war, Lord Ram himself and Sri Krishna. All of them, of course, Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Imagine mother thinking about her child and doing what she did. Or Sri Aurobindo worrying about his wife. It's not that he didn't love and care. But there was a much larger context. Or for that matter, Buddha himself. So all these are examples wherein we have to live for something much greater. And wife is there, child is there, everybody is there. But not for my own gratification. They are there for their own unique development along their own unique lines and my role is to support, to help and it would be an ideal world where this support is mutual from everyone and everything. But that of course is a still a far off dream. But at least the person who is a practitioner of yoga has to abandon the ego self and all the band of enemies, that's how it describes. Um, whose names are desire, wrath, fear, all of them, which we'll read in, in some other passages. So, this is the sacrifice, and then he says this leads automatically. The triune path means the path of works, the path of knowledge, and the path of love. They are intertwined. It's not a mechanical action. So, this mechanical action should be full of love, and it should be impelled with knowledge. It's not a blind kind of giving. It should be done with wisdom. It should be done with love in the heart. But whom should we have love for? And that's where it comes, the Lord of the sacrifice. So in the, it's straight from the Gita. We know Sri Krishna speaks about what is Adhyatma, what is Adhibhut, what is Adhidev and what is Adhiyagya. So very beautifully he says, I am Adhiyagya. <laughs> so very beautifully. So the Lord of the sacrifice is the divine inhabitant in all. And there Sri Aurobindo gives us very, very beautiful uh, small little reminders that whoever is the gift uh, which is given to whomsoever you should give it to the divine in the person whoever is the person giving to you the recipient must always receive it from the divine inside so all this in detail and what can be <laughs> given what can be given in this yagya anything and everything yagya Shobindo reminds us in its original sense is not self immolation because the word sacrifice is like, oh, I'll go to Tirupati and leave my ears. Or I'll part something from my pocket. Sacrifices literally means in fire when you burn something, it becomes pure and refined. So when you put something as a sacrifice, as a yagya, it automatically becomes refined, uh, purified. So all the dross begins to go away. So when people work for the divine with the idea that I am working for the divine, then automatically the ego and ambition sense begins to become weaker and weaker. Desire, which will enter initially, even when we work for the divine, automatically the desire self enters. We want certain special privileges. If nothing else, some experiences. There are people who seek experiences from the divine. But slowly all these things become quiet when our sacrifice is perfected. And Shubhinda goes on to say, even our very heart beats and breath should be offered to the divine. So that's the sacrifice, which is a yagya. And then there are very two beautiful chapters. Every chapter is beautiful. But here he elaborates the ascent of sac the sacrifice, the works of knowledge and the psychic being. So ordinarily, when we speak about uh, sacrifice or offering, we believe it's an inner offering of our internal self. Or we say, let us say as a doctor when I am uh, offering, I say that well I am practicing medicine, the way medicine is there, but I am offering myself to the divine, this action to the divine. 
Now what happens in that a gradation is created. So there are works which people believe are closer to the divine and there are works which are farther away from the divine. Then the second level of division which takes place is a priest. Somebody who is working in the temple is working for God. But somebody who is working in the world is not working for God. It's an automatic, in the mind, this division starts. Somebody living in the ashram is closer to the divine. Somebody who is far away is not closer to the divine. <clears throat> so all these divisions have to go, but it requires a reorientation. So what is that reorientation quote Sherbindo gives us, and we'll read that passage subsequently. That reorientation is that what will I do when I deal with sciences? What should be my approach? So in science, my approach should be, how does the divine consciousness work through, what are these processes through which the end result is what it is, which is matter. That's how in ancient India, we had built such a powerful civilization. Why? Because in everything and through everything, we were seeking the divine and we were filling everything with some touch of the divine. We already have that in Ayurveda is born through the tapasya and prayers of the rishis. Um, the dance form, the art forms In art, for instance, in painting At one place, Sri says What is the purpose of art? The purpose of art is To reveal what nature hides For instance, nature hides the divine presence uh, When we look at a tree, we don't look at the divine Now the purpose of art is to bring out That divine presence which is inhabiting it Through beauty, through effulgence Now how we do it is that's where our whole uh, capacity lies. Uh, of course, there are realists who have taken this seriously, but in the other way. So they bring out all that is in the name of realism, all that is dirty and dark. This is also hidden, no doubt. But when it is said, what is hidden is the highest, the best, the most luminous. So purpose of art, music, poetry, all of them is to reveal the divine working in the world. Beautifully, Shobindo captures in his poem, Who? We shall tell the whole world of his ways and his cunning. So this cunning, how he has woven the thread of life. And it's very fascinating, which means anything we can catch and reach the divine. But the purpose should be, this is how it was in ancient India. We have stopped it. So we see that new dance forms, new ragas, music forms have stopped coming. It should come because the divine is infinite. There should be very different combinations which should, you know, in future they will come. We see it in Mother's Music or Sunilda. It doesn't fall into a standard format. Dance, new form should come. New ways of expression of still higher and greater realities. So in poetry, Shubhinder speaks about future poetry. In sciences, all this should be a new. Mother at one place says, I have prepared everything in the subtle physical and left it there. For man to discover and manifest it. And she goes on to say, for example, with cancer. She says the cure of cancer has been found. Now, recently, last I think one month or two months, people have started speaking about discovering something which can cure all the cancers almost magically with practically no side effects. We don't know whether it is the magic formula or not, but man has to discover it. To discover it, he has to... Stop living under the illusion of whatever is known and search that which is not yet known by knocking the doors of the unknowable. So this is the whole thing he reveals about the works of knowledge. And if we do it, then the psychic being begins to emerge as the mind becomes quiet, the knowledge flames from within and the soul is the seat where all this knowledge is embedded. So the true knower is the soul and it opens directly to the divine and that that knowledge begins to flow in everything, every activity, whatever field a person chooses or is meant to do, express. So this is where Shubhinder says that if we follow the path of works, any activity can become a means for opening the door which is within us. And then of course he describes it at great length and then he takes to the ascent of the sacrifice Second part, which is the works of love, the works of life. So, knowledge he describes in great detail, science, art, everything. What about works of love? What about human relationship? People normally say, what has that got to do with God and divine? So, he reveals, no, all adoration has a spiritual force in it. That's why we will see in ancient India, nothing was denied 
if it had a possibility to that extent that a woman could realize the divine simply by loving her husband that was the whole idea of sati of course modern person will say why not the husband well my answer is because husbands are not capable of loving as simple as that so ancient india knew who can really manifest true love <laughs> it was the feminine power men had other things to do if they could take care if they could bring out the soft tender of emotions from the heart protection care affection of course there are men who can love like that but that's very rare but the idea was even in human relationship in human love you can bring that element if you see the divine in the one whom you love <clears throat> so all that comes out in the works of love love itself becomes a means of manifesting the divine and works of life means everything that we are doing all the little activities uh, there the sense of beauty we, we know that in four aspects of the divine mother shobindra has elaborated the right thing the right moment the right way the right method the right process all this in the vedic ages was regarded as the function of dakshina the goddess who gave impelled us for right action so all that he reveals here then come this interesting chapter standards of conduct and spiritual freedom so how does such a man act <laughs> so of course shri krishna touches upon it and says you will be trigunatit you will act under the divine will so what does it mean because we still may say divine will means this we put our own mental ideas so here shubindo reveals to us what how standards of conduct have evolved the first standard of conduct which is there in human being is impelled by the brute sense of life he just safeguards himself destroys whatever life is meant to affirm and assert it like that's the animal kind of standard of conduct for an animal to protect by any means and to fulfill satiate his desire for food hunger by any means is justifiable but fortunately animal a python after taking a nice meal of a huge big animal for one month or two months will not do anything but human beings if it makes a meal it will store it in the fridge go on to the other meal that is a problem with human beings but this is the standard which we see in the early studies of life but to subordinate it there comes the sense of society the tribe the clan so you have social standards so in social standards you must conform to the law of the society it could be a religious law it could be a secular law it could be law of the land whatever you have to subordinate your individual desire self um, you can't just be driven by your own hungers you have to do it according to you can amass money but you have to pay the taxes which should be used for all of course human mind is super deceptive it has found a way to evade the taxes so that's a different story altogether but this is how we subordinate the individual standard of conduct to social you have to conform to certain social rules and ways of life most human beings live according to that that but because society is imperfect society evolves standard imagine you know today people living in the islamic world sorry to say but when you know people had no hath uh, kaat do cut the hand behead the head people literally follow it there was a time when warring tribes would snatch take away women make them slaves so the only way was make the women covered from head to toe whether it helped or not i don't know but at least it guarded the sins in secret so this is the way people are devised now you can't remain stuck in that way of social life it may have had a validity in a certain context when you have very brutal ruthless people you know governing a tribe they were tribes very ruthless and brutal so there these things were understandable because how to uh, keep human beings um, in place check will behead you if you steal your hands will be cut so you know people felt that fear and became uh, so called you know but obviously it doesn't require any <laughs> rocket science to understand these two primitive the punishment is as primitive or more primitive than a man you know this was so beautifully indicated even modern society's hypocrisy 
there's a movie uh, miracle on the 34th street so the 34th street referred to new york where uh, you know <laughs> a boy has to confess to a priest after a sin so what is the sin he had done so he explains santa is the hero in that movie there's a psychologist he says no i did something wrong so all these notions were put in right and wrong so what did he do he he felt happy about a toy and he picked it up and he says no uh, i am not supposed to do it so i have committed a sin and he says what can a young boy of 7 do which is wrong so you know modern society challenge these primitive notions and evolve new ones but there are societies which have become static but who challenges them there comes the individual so the third standard of conduct is individual this is what the society says but i don't believe in that i want to evolve my own because it it uh, that's how many outdated things pass away from existence for instance you know there were even in in uh, indian thought there were things which were not a right thing to do uh, especially with regard to women which was not ancient india but uh, medieval period under the influence of islam and christianity that certain contaminants viruses contaminated us and then individuals revolted some revolted saying that this was not so in ancient india this not the truth of things and some revolted saying whatever it be we must bring in a new way and that's how societies evolve because individuals revolt so the third standard of conduct is the individual looks inside and says i want to do what i think is the right thing so shobindu says why this is required in social evolution he says because there is some imperfection in the social law so or in its application or is in its principle like the chaturvarn it was wrongly applied over a period of time it lost its truth so there was a revolt so the third standard of conduct is again individual but not the brute individual but an individual who has organized his life around some great ideal he lives for that great ideal we see that people like raja ram mohan roy people all over the world they started this reform from within because they felt certain things are not right but is this the end that's where he comes in the highest standard is to be driven by the divine will so how to perceive that divine will that's where the uh, the chapter comes the supreme will so it can enter in as an enthusiasm as a deep inspiration the work that we are meant to do it gives us the capacity the faculty the force everything but for that we have to quieten all other standards of conduct which clamor for attention if we can do that if we can get rid of preferences get rid of the ego self then we can become instruments of the supreme will in creation then comes okay to do that you have to get rid of preferences desires ego how to do that so the next chapter is equality and the annihilation of the ego the first practice is equality one of the fundamental practices of yoga and what is summarized in gita in a few shlokas uh, shubindu elaborates it so first kind of equality is that equality towards all the different things to see god in all second is not only in people but in events and circumstances so one has to see the divine working behind not curse complain one may not understand the truth but still equality then in contacts of physical nature uh, then psychologically or to insults hate calumny one has to practice <laughs> equanimity contrary thoughts contrary views ideas opinions practice equanimity but here shobindu brings something very interesting and that's about equanimity has another aspect that is dynamic how do i then act if i don't make choices because i am equal to all things how will i act so shubindo speaks about that and it, it's not just about divine will manifesting but he says equanimity and equality doesn't mean blurring of distinctions it doesn't mean that i eat khichdi and rasgulla together and say i am very equal that is foolish i know what is rasgul i know what is khichdi but if khichdi is served with me i take it with joy the rasa of khichdi i don't say oh my god three days one place i had this experience so all the three days afternoon and night i was served khichdi with papad 
So I was saying, Shubhinda wants me to practice this equanimity. <laughs> now, Khichadi is good. And every day the um, host was justifying it. His first day it was very good for health. You have travelled. So I said, yes, that is true. I agree. <laughs> Next day it's it's good to keep the, you know, it's look at the weather and our Khichadi is very good for this. <laughs> Third day it was. <laughs> it reminds me of a story of my friend. He was um, from uh, Chennai and he was married to an Asmis girl. So, complete dark complexion and absolutely like positive and negative side of films. And uh, this fellow, pilot friend, he fought with everybody and got married literally in a very filmy style. So, when she came, he naturally, pilot friend, started calling people home for dinner. So, first day she made rice and karela, bitter goat. People ate, friends after all. Next day, another set again, rice and karela. Third day, again, rice and karela. So, he says, see, I love you, but please, can can we have a different dish? She says, I don't know any other dish except this one. <laughs> Very religiously, she was doing what she was trained to do. And <laughs> so, it is not does not mean blurring of distinction. We understand what is what. This idea of equality, we should, that you know, everything is same, all is same. We should understand things are different. In nature, there is a hierarchy, there is a stratification. You can't help it. And yet one can be equal. To the enemy and the friend, even when one is wrestling and fighting a war, still there should be no hatred inside. That's what equanimity would eventually mean. Yes, the three modes of nature, which we know, very well, the Sattva, Raja, Tamaguna, and we have already spoken about it in the Gita. It's a very well-known uh, knowledge and uh, Shubhinda will later reveal to us how that ha can be transmuted. Even nature can be transformed. This is not there in the Gita. Gita speaks of the man who is inwardly liberated. But when he acts, he still comes under Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. That means there will be ignorance in his choices. So neither the Gita speaks about that aspect wherein through every knowledge you can contact the divine, knowledge form. And knowledge itself will expand because there will be a divine influx of higher and higher knowledge. The Gita speaks about Maitri Karuna Ivascha. But how in differentiation of relationships you are going to bring in the divine element. All that is not there. And also the three gunas, Trigunatmak Prakarti, that will remain. You can rise above the three gunas. But here it's a transformation of the three gunas because they, the three gunas come from higher divine forces. Sri Krishna hints when he speaks about his nature. He speaks about his para prakriti, of which the jiva is born. He speaks about sabhava and sudharma which is inbuilt within the jiva. But what that para prakriti is in, in its real sense, he hints for instance in Devasuri Sampada. He gives some hint about the devic Sampada which comes closer to the true divine nature and he asks us to cultivate it but Shubhinda describes about how these gunas for instance tamo guna tamo guna is to be transformed into self-existent peace rajas into luminous force and um, and and wisdom and sat guna into compassion into light so into the joy the felicity that is their self-existence in the divine so <clears throat> the three modes of nature and finally the master of the work. Who is the master of the work? Now in the Gita everywhere we see Sri Krishna referring to himself. So many people think he is only talking about himself, the physical Sri Krishna. Of course he is talking of himself because he is the avatar of the age. And uh, he has said this in a super conscious state. Sri Krishna himself speaks about it. Later on, that it was given in a superconscious state when his eye is completely identified with the Purushottama, of whom he is the avatar. But if we keep it only to that, then we uh, isolate, exclude many others who may be approaching in different ways. So the three elements which he takes up is, one is the instrument, instrumental personality, the ego self. Through a persistent consecration, the ego self has to be subordinated to become an instrument of the divine. The second is, apart from the instrument, the force that is at work, which ordinarily are the three gunas, nature and not us. 
and this nature when we give it to the divine then it changes into the luminous divine force and the third is who is the doer the doer is the master of the work he is the doer everything goes to him and comes from him so this is the realization in which uh, the yogin rises the divine work so what really is the divine work what is its purpose is it just to maintain a balance in creation or to carry the march of uh, humanity forward all that shri bindu reveals what is divine work what is its secret and finally the super mind and the yoga of works so there he draws the clear distinction because ordinarily in the ordinary yoga of works the yogin is still guided by his highest that moment shri krishna has told him shoot the arrow bring down the enemies because they are not just a question of your personal battle but they are standing for adharma but how are we to do this in everyday life in everyday affair so that's where the all comprehensive truth comes into play where every action has so many aspects and dimensions to it which super mind can reveal to us so that is the supramental way of doing works which of course humanity has to move very far and the instruments have to be able to change and bear the influx of the divine energy the supramental forces of the divine so all that he reveals in these wonderful chapters and now i'll read so i've been rushing through so that we can read a little bit practice of the yoga <clears throat> the yoga must start with an effort or at least a settled turn towards the total concentration consecration starts with this concentration you have to keep reorient a constant and unfailing will of consecration of all ourselves to the supreme is demanded of us an offering of our whole being and our many chambered nature to the eternal who is the all so there is no like i will continue to do all my life time to time remember god go to the temple and that's it no everything has to be consecrated to the divine and then he says something uh, interestingly the effective fullness of our concentration on the on the one thing needful to the exclusion of all else will be the measure of our self consecration to the one who is alone desirable now he is using the word exclusion so what does exclusion means it's not about activity but any activity which is undertaken only for the sake of pleasure and for ego satisfaction that we will exclude and we'll undertake only those activities which bring us in contact with the divine either in terms of service or in terms of knowing the divine so the question comes naturally again that won't it create a division so should be the immediately answers but this exclusiveness will in the end exclude nothing except the falsehood of our way of seeing the world and our wills ignorance so we'll deal with everything but there is something we need to exclude so what is that for our concentration on the eternal will be consummated by the mind when we see constantly the divine in itself and the divine in ourselves but also the divine in all things and beings and happenings so every object becomes for us something of the divine something which breathes the divine consciousness every human being becomes for us a mask of the divine so this is how he reveals to us then sacrifice the true essence of sacrifice is not self immolation this idea of torturing oneself i will not eat food for well for weight control you can do it but don't think god is very pleased that three days and three nights i didn't eat food and didn't eat water even shri krishna he says don't don't take to extremes everywhere he speaks of this so this idea somewhere has crept into not that those who want to do it can do it because sanatan dharma is very wide and all inclusive in that sense but we must understand that all the standard books of sanatan dharma the gita the upanishad um Uh, the vedas they talk about avoiding these extremes later purana some up upanishads they have brought in this element but essentially in the standard books this extremes are to be avoided what is instead advised is the advice of buddha moderation in everything 
So here he says the essence of sacrifice is not self immolation, it is self giving. Its object not self effacement. It does not mean anybody and everybody we go and say, Ki, okay, kick me like a football. You may do it sometimes to gain in San Shakti. There is a story I read long back of Sukhadev, Rajguru and Bhagat Singh. So Sukhadev and Rajguru were going in a train. So the Britishers, some of these people saw them and they obviously something they saw and they started beating and wanted them to say something. And that time neither of them said anything. So their friend said you could have given them black and blue. He said no, that time I just wanted to develop my endurance. So sometimes you can do it. But not as a way of life that in everywhere I'll become a martyr. No human being is expected to do that because then he is not sacrificing himself to the divine. That sacrifice is not a right thing to do. It is not to the right object, not to the right recipient. You are sacrificing either to your own alter ego that see I am so good that I am sacrificing or to the ego of another person. So you are turning him into a titan which is not good for him. So this sacrifice has to be only at the altar of the divine. So it's he's very clear that its method, so its object, not self-effacement, but self-fulfillment. When we give to the divine, we are fulfilled. Its method, not self-mortification. Sleeping on a bed of nails, torturing oneself, deliberately lying on the floor. No, that's not the way. But a greater life. Not self-mutilation. There are people who torture themselves, you know, hitting their back and everything, piercing their tongue and, you know, that's so horrifying. To Even divine would be saying, <laughs> this is not how you will find me. That's the way of the asuras. They, they torture themselves. So that the divine comes and says, Bhai, abhi to band kar. Because why? Because divine is being tortured. We don't realize because he is the one who is present. <clears throat> so he says, not self-mutilation but a transformation of our natural human parts into divine members. Not self-torture but a passage from a lesser satisfaction to a greater ananda. All renunciation is for a greater ananda. So then he says, there is only one thing painful in the beginning to a raw or turbid part of the surface nature. It is the indispensable discipline demanded. The denial necessary for the merging of the incomplete ego. But for that there can be a speedy and enormous compensation in the discovery of a real greater or ultimate completeness in others. So in the beginning, that's why many things in Indian thought were enjoined. They were meant to discipline ourselves in the early stages. So in the beginning it's painful. But when we do it with the idea of the divine, to see the divine in the other person, then we discover that. Our sacrifice is not a giving without any return. But of course, this uh, is not the, Shubhinda says, that we should not give with the idea of return. And then he says it leads to this uh, constant inward remembrance of the one central liberating knowledge. And what is that knowledge? In all is the one self. The one divine is all. All are in the divine. And all are the divine and there is nothing else in the universe. This thought or this faith is the whole background until it becomes the whole substance of the consciousness of the worker. Repeatedly, everywhere, the mother in 19, late 60s, she says, yes, when you are bombarded by all the confusions, what you should do? You should keep on telling yourself, all is the divine, all is the divine, all is the divine. Otherwise, you cannot lead this life. Now, okay, divine distorted in appearance, but even the distortion somewhere... In the larger context, it must change, yes. But the first step is that all is the divine, very clearly. A memory, a self-dynamizing meditation of this kind. Because why when you keep saying, reminding all is the divine, then the appearances begin to change. Why? Because you are bringing out that divine element in creation. 
have often recounted this story when you look at a patient oh god why are you wearing this mask of illness raj say oh my god how terrible oh god why are you wearing this mask when we keep on emphasizing this aspect then it helps so for it compels a constant reference at each moment to the origin of all being and will and action and there is at once an embracing and exceeding of all particular forms and appearances whatever we see and hear whatever we touch and sense all of which we are conscious has to be known and felt by us as that which we worship and serve all has to be turned into an image of the divinity perceived as a dwelling place of his godhead enveloped with the eternal omnipresence so prison wall and everything and then he says nothing must be attempted for ourselves is a separate existence making money making name fame ambition nothing done for others whether neighbors friends family country or mankind or other creatures merely because they are connected with a personal life and thought and sentiment or because the ego takes a preferential interest in their welfare so you know when somebody comes speaking my language ah very good you have a special pass or somebody who is connected with me ah ami apnar dadar badi oh very good kotha hai thake oh very good very good come 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 you want to go to meditate you you are allowed somebody else speaking let us say in tamil or kannada and we don't know wait outside rule does not allow this is where we have to get rid of all these different ideas ego taking preferential interest it's not that you have to discard them but with every one there is it the right law of being everybody has to be helped and uh, to grow so he said life becomes more and more the sacrifice of the eternal in the individual constantly self offered to the eternal transcendence so that's how the individual and the transcendent are connected the divine in me loves the divine in you through this form that's how it has to become and here he speaks about what should be our aim in sciences and everything the yogin's aim in the sciences that make for knowledge should be to discover and understand the workings of the divine consciousness pusa in man and creatures and things and forces her creative significances her execution of the mysteries the symbols in which she arranges the manifestation in every science medical science engineering science whatever science the yogin same in the practical sciences whether mental and physical or occult and psychic should be to enter into the ways of the divine and his processes and so on the yogin's aim in the art should not be a mere aesthetic mental or vital gratification but seeing the divine everywhere worshiping it with the revelation of the meaning of its own works to express the one divine in ideal forms the one divine in principles and forces the one divine in gods and men and creatures and objects several places he speaks about you know uh, that particular uh, bust of buddha where you see the face expresses the immobile serenity which is marvelous because you bring out that deeper aspect of buddha in a form or that nataraj why is it so famous because it captures in one single vigraha or an image the deep truth of the cosmic dancer so he reveals and um, of course this takes time which we should not grudge and then he speaks about as the psychic being begins to emerge what happens but the most intimate character of the psychic is its pressure towards the divine through a sacred love joy and oneness it is a divine love that it seeks most it is the love of the divine that is its spur its goal its star of truth shining over the luminous cave of the nascent or the still obscure in nature but something before that what happens <clears throat> when the psychic begins to come out 
Its character is a one-pointed orientation toward the divine or the highest. One-pointed and yet plastic in action and movement. It does not create a rigidity of direction like the one-pointed intellect or a bigotry of the regnant idea. So it is one-pointed toward the highest. But it is not like only this way, not this way. Everything, it turns like many rivers coming from the same source and going toward the sea. But what it insists on is truth rather than falsehood. This discernment is given to the psyche. <clears throat> then another very interesting aspect of the psychic emergence is it may still admit the human forms and movements but on condition that they are turned toward the one alone. Because it's turned toward the divine. So what about human beings? So here should be in the sage in the beginning what happens? It expects only the ties that are helpful. The hearts and minds reverence for the Guru, the union of the God seekers, a spiritual compassion for this ignorant human and animal world and its peoples. So there is the reverence and giving to the Guru in the human persona. Then company of God lovers and God seekers very naturally and towards general humanity. It's not like, hey, who are they? Compassion. Why? Because they are caught up, trapped in this ignorance. They are suffering and it gives itself to relieve that suffering of mankind. So towards animals and creatures everywhere, it moves this way. It plunges the nature inward towards its meeting with the imminent, imminent divine. But in the end, what happens? It opens to a universal divine love, if we continue this way, a vast compassion, an intense and immense will for the good of all. For the embrace of the world mother, enveloping <laughs> or gathering to her, her children. The divine passion that has plunged into the night for the redemption of the world from the universal inconscience. So if we continue along this, a vast universal compassion, a wisdom, a universal love for all creatures, the even plunging into the darkness to rescue, to redeem earth, all this begins to develop. So this is, and... Then he says that what happens when this love begins to manifest? So is it like just a universal love or there are special relations? So there will be special bonds. But a psychic change is demanded. A divestiture of the mass of the ignorance. A purification of the egoistic, mental, vital and physical movements that prolong the old inferior movements. And then this is very beautiful passage. All love, indeed that is adoration has a spiritual force behind it. And even when it is offered ignorantly and to a limited object, that's why we see Mandodri, that's why we see uh, Tara, uh, you know, how they have been exalted to the uh, state of, what is that, Prata Smarani Panchkanya. What did they do? It is directed towards Ravana and Tara towards, you know, Bali and Sukriv. And yet, it has a spiritual force in it when done rightly with a sense of adoration. Something of that splendor appears through the poverty of the right and the smallness of its issues. For love that is worship is at once an aspiration and a preparation. It can bring, even within its small limits in the ignorance, a glimpse of a still more or less blind and partial but surprising realization. For there are moments when it is not we but the one who loves and is loved in us. And even a human passion can be uplifted and glorified by a slight glimpse of this infinite love and lover. It is for this reason that the worship of the God, the worship of the idol, the human magnet or ideal are not to be despised for those are steps through which the human race moves towards that 
blissful passion and ecstasy of the infinite which even in limiting it they yet represent for our imperfect vision so he makes all the steps and he goes on to say even after discovering the infinite you can still go because the physical needs that fullness and completeness so it is then a transformation of life in its very principle two rules he reminds us like a reminder we should put everywhere many such reminders are very helpful two rules alone there are that will diminish the difficulty and obviate the danger because obviously a wide path like this going through everything is dangerous that's why people want a safe rule be like a sanyasi away from the world so here you are entering the world you can be contaminated you can slip there are dangers at every step and the rules are one must reject all that comes from the ego the vital from vital desire this want this craving from the mere mind at its presumptuous reasoning in competence all that ministers to these agents of the ignorance this is the first rule the second is one must learn to hear and follow the voice of the inmost soul the direction of the guru the command of the master the working of the divine mother whoever clings to the desires and weaknesses of the flesh the cravings and passions of the vital in its turbulent ignorance the dictates of his personal mind unsilenced and unillumined by greater knowledge cannot find the true inner law a radical and total change of consciousness is not only the whole meaning but in an increasing force and by progressive stage stages the whole method of the integral yoga then of course um, he speaks about that desires will enter so what are we supposed to do with it you have to keep offering through constant remembrance keep purifying remove them from the hold of the asuras until they get completely purified and removed this is interesting everything is interesting of course what is the work that we should undertake normally we undertake a job which either our own uh, something has felt impelled because of ambition desire or if you come to a place like ashram whatever you are given uh, of course the gita speaks about swadharma and shubhendra says the work itself is at first determined by the best light we can command in our ignorance it is that which we conceive as the thing that should be done and whether it be shaped by our sense of duty by our feeling for our fellow creatures by our idea of what is for the good of others or the good of the world or by the direction of one whom we accept as a human master the principle is the same so initially it starts with our own highest sense that we can conceive how best these energies can be utilized in the service of the good of the world we can put it like that to cut the knot of desire the most powerful way of course written in the gita but shubhendra reminds us is really very powerful way just this nishkam karma all other things if you forget even remembrance even sarva sankalp sanyasi but just that i'll not i'm not going to act for the fruits of my labor that itself is very powerful because or normally we act for fruits desire is always coveting fruit when it doesn't get what it wants it moves away so when we engage in action without demand for the fruit or crying for the fruit then slowly the knot of desire begins to be removed so the illumining word of this movement is the decisive line of the gita to action thou hast a right but never under any circumstances to its fruit later on even the right to action is taken away it the divine who works but in the beginning the fruit belongs solely to the lord of all works 
our only business with it is to prepare success by a true and careful action and to offer it if it comes to the divine master later on one has to renounce attachment to the work and the initiation and ultimately the divine begins to work and finally about equality equality does not mean a fresh ignorance or blindness it does not call for and need not initiate a grayness of vision and a blurring blotting of all hues so this is the dangerous aspect of communism as it is practiced today socialism as it is understood and the left liberal thought all are same so i should be careful when i join hands to bharat jodo i may be joining hands unwittingly with the serpent who is going to come with my hand walk into my house then devour me this is the foolishness of a kind of thought yes it is a left liberal thought which is misapplying a great truth and the world has suffered a lot because of misapplication of profound truth it appeals to the human beings today because well this is the age who doesn't want to be liberal but liberal doesn't mean blurring of distinctions difference is there variation of expression is there and this variation we shall appreciate far more justly than we could when the eyes was clouded by a partial and erring love and hate see how he is saying erring love and hate you want to join hands with everybody but not with one particular different ideology why <laughs> because what kind of joining hands is this this is because we are blurred the vision is clouded but if we really want to join we should not lose the distinctions each one who is doing good a truly a you know mother india's son how would he act whoever and whatsoever comes and does good to the country it doesn't matter who who even if somebody who is from the opposition you would say that's wonderful and that's why i appreciate again it's not a political lecture but certain beautiful thing how vajpay ji literally you know appreciated indira gandhi after the 71 war and he said like durga you have worked but that doesn't mean that for all times to come the legacy continues so that's because whoever it could be any leader of any party but also in our human dealings even if your enemy does something which is beautiful like a beautiful gesture we should appreciate that it's something beautiful that's how you know let beautiful thoughts come from every side doesn't mean make a kechadi of bible quran and the geeta in your head and get confused it means wherever there is something which speaks of the divine which brings out the beauty which is in human nature pick that up blot out the rest it's not necessary one must know the difference this movement has started so so he says you will be better able to do it why because we'll be freed from erring love and hate admiration and scorn sympathy and antipathy attraction and repulsion but behind the variation we shall always see the complete and immutable who dwells within it and we shall feel no or at least if it is hidden from us trust in the wise purpose and divine necessity of the particular manifestation so we'll know why there is opposition why there is seemingly uh, obstacle even to the divine working and so to we shall have the same equality of mind and soul towards all happenings painful or pleasurable defeat and success honor and disgrace good repute and ill repute good fortune and evil fortune for in all happenings we shall see the will of the master of all works and results and a step in the evolving expression of the divine so when we do this and he reminds us to revolt to condemn to cry out is the impulse of our unchastened and ignorant instincts revolt like everything else has its uses in the play it has its it's even necessary helpful decreed for the divine development in its own time and stage that's why we are talking about revolt against the shastra but the movement of an ignorant rebellion belongs to the stage of the soul childhood or to its raw adolescence therefore we shall receive all things with an equal soul from the hands of the master failure we shall admit as a passage as calmly 
as success until the hour of the divine victory arrives. Our souls and minds and bodies will remain unshaken by acutest sorrow and suffering and pain. If in the divine dispensation they come to us, unoverpowered by the intensest joy and pleasure. So he says this equality cannot come without a protracted idea, prolonged journey. It's not like one day. It's a lifelong and even it's, it grows in stages, in areas. One may be equal in one area, but another area one is vulnerable. One may be equal in the, that particular area to something, but to something else, if the intensity is increased, one becomes vulnerable. So there is no limit to which it can be developed. So finally, to close, <clears throat> then we are at last capable of receiving all contacts with the blissful equality because we feel in them the touch of the imperishable love and delight, the happiness absolute that hides ever in the heart of things. In all events, circumstances, people, situations, we'll receive that contact of the divine. This is called as living in by the will of God. Whatever is the will, we accept it. The gain of this culmination is a universal and equal rapture, is the soul's delight and the opening gates of the bliss that is infinite, the joy that surpasses all understanding. So the key practices are consecration, surrender, <laughs> remember and offer, nishkam karma, in every field, in every activity, reference to the Divine Master who is everywhere and in all things, but most of all seated in the heart of all creatures, to join the individual soul with the transcendent by everything in the path and the passage, initially giving up the fruit, then the desire, then being driven only by the will of God. And finally, this practice of equanimity, renouncing all supports of egoism, that's repeatedly Shubindo reminds us that we can't divide our life between two parallel lines. All supports of egoism must be renounced and the only support that we have to seek is in the divine, for the divine, to belong to the divine, to live the divine, to love the divine, to be the divine.